So again, good morning. Some of you have seen me speak over the years. No, I don't speak with my shoes on. And uh, I've explained over the years the many reasons for that. It's the same reason I have my keyboard on today. The uh, context of it is connected to an act actually of respect. It's not an act of disrespect. Um, and I've also mentioned that uh, some people have discovered I was born in the island of Jamaica. And they have their interpretation because, you know, a lot of kids in Jamaica walk barefoot. And they figure, you know, you take the man out of the island, but not the island out of the man. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, what I'm going to do um, is to talk, really just to contextualize some of the things we'll talk about today through some remarks on Gary Tobin and how his work, how he and I got together and worked in these areas. Now, uh, before I continue, however, um, I'd like to mention that I also have uh, three wonderful assistants here today. Uh, I have Al Ariella Werden. I, I, I always want to say Werden because I study German, so who, who, who's the main assistant for the Center for, um, you know, for Afro-Jewish Studies. Uh, we had a period where we did not um, have an assistant for a while, so some of you are trying to contact us and we weren't responding, that's the reason. But now we're back on the ball. And if you'd like, at the end, to find a way to be connected to us, discuss it with Ariella. We also have Devon Johnson, who has been with, with, with us from day one. And uh, Devon has been instrumental in many ways, not only as an intellectual, but also in terms of the way he has really helped us work at our infrastructure. And we have our man on visuals, our tech man, the man who who is going to make, try to make sure that everything works. You know, if you have a team, you've got to have a tech man. And this is Vince Beavers, who's also a doctoral student in philosophy. I just thought in the beginning, you could get a sense of the people with whom we're working. Now, Gary Tobin. Well, some of you may have read the literature about Gary Tobin. As you know, he passed away in July, July 6th of this year. And some of you may have be f been familiar with everything he's done in terms of, for instance, his work with birthright with Israel, in addition to the work he has done around critical issues around Jewish demography, as well as issues he has done around race and social justice. But I would like simply to begin first by just talking about the kind of human being he was. And when I say this, um, you can have a sense of this in terms of the events around his death. And I'm not going to get into all the details there. But he knew he was facing death for a period of, well, when he was first informed, it was a short time, but he, it, it went over a period of a year. And you learn a lot about people in terms of how they face that issue. Um, throughout, he focused on community building. He focused on his family. He was traveling, and he, he kept the work going. And as I saw him doing this, I just looked and I kept thinking, what a courageous human being. And when I say courage here, I don't mean what it is to face the fears one may have. When I mean courage in an ethical sense of what it is to be a person who, in the face of something that is so ultimate, is always through and through thinking about others. You see? For him, the fundamental issue is what, what, how do we continue a project that brings to the forefront the question of human dignity? And so it's in that context, I think, of Gary Tobin. Now, how I met him is very unusual because I met him through one of the speakers today, Walter Isaac. Walter Isaac was at Brown University uh, doing work with me, and he, he said, oh, there's this meeting going on in San Francisco, and it's gonna be a gathering of Jews from all over the world. But at the time, I was tired of meetings. I was giving a lot of talks. I was building a program, and I just went through one of the most vicious, difficult battles you could imagine. Some of you know that I'm on the list of 101 most dangerous professors. <laughs> and that was because David Horowitz, as you know, uh, 
in particular this hatred of, 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 of black professors in the academy, uh, presented a lot of misrepresentations of me that led to death threats, up to 500 hate mail a day with things like, die you pathetic nigger. It was a horrible period. And in the midst of all of that, those struggles, um, while doing what I was doing and have to have my mail checked for plastic bombs and all of this, the idea of taking on another meaning. But Walter Isaac said, I think this will be very important. You should go. <laughs> and so I said, all right, Walter, <laughs> I will go to San Francisco. When I came to San Francisco, I saw this very active man with a kind of sparkling in his eye, interacting with individuals. And I also have to tell you, when I went to San Francisco, you have to picture this. Now look, you know, I know a thing or two about black Jews. And uh, you know, part of that is connected to looking in the mirror each day. But still, nothing can ever prepare one for the experience of going into a room of 150, sometimes 200 different meetings, Jews of color from all over the world. You know, just that powerful moment. Because you see, it not only, it's not only what you see, but it makes you correct your own projections and others. Because as you know, one of the things about any group of people, it's not just Jewish people, any group of people, everybody thinks their version is the version, <laughs> right? So you go anywhere, you know, we're, 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 you know, it's a know-it-all thing. So it creates a profound moment of humility because it makes you realize, you may think you know a lot, but there's so much you do not know. And so in the midst of this, I met this wonderful man who was there giving us, giving these wonderful speeches. He, he, he broke out with these, uh, there were these moments where with his humor, you know, he, he how can I put it? I, I, I performed in the, I, I played drums <coughs> in the off-Broadway version of this, so I, I, I'm very familiar with this. He went fiddler on the roof of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I thought, what a beautiful person. Anyway, to make a long story short, when he and I met, it was love at first sight. And what that meant was, okay, because you see, when you're doing community work, when you're doing academic work, you can do a lot of things, um, there's a way in which you can work with people if they are, they are fundamentally, they, they, there's an immediate sense of certain lines. But once you realize you're close to someone in this way, then there are certain things you realize, there are certain projects you can't do together because you are first and foremost friends. You see what I'm saying? And that was, so given that, that now made the meetings very different because it meant I had work I was doing, some things we'll meet, um, but fundamentally we were about each other. And as Capers mentioned in Rabbi Capers Panay, who will speak later, in one of his dedications to Gary Tobin, it's a realization what happens when you're brothers. Okay? Now, in this context, one of the things about the Tobins, Gary Tobin is married to Diane Tobin. Well, you know. And Diane Tobin had three children. Gary Tobin had two children from a prior marriage. Together, I know it sounds pretty much, but. It, together, they got together and then they thought they would like to have, to add a sixth child to the family. But they decided they will adopt. And so they went to an adoption agency and the, the, official, the, the, the representative of the agency said, well, what child do you want? What, what, what gender? What race? And, and they looked and said, what do you mean? And they said, well, if you don't specify, for instance, you want a white girl, a white boy, a Chinese boy, a Chinese girl, if you don't say these things, they'll give you an African-American boy. All right? Now, when you think about the question of race, that really brings it out. You know, one of the things about American race stuff that we don't often talk about is how race and gender meet. And race and gender, particularly in the United States, really, you know, yeah, people always say black, white, but they don't understand. It's really very specific. And the fundamental bogeyman, so to speak, in American consciousness.
the bogeyman, so to speak, in the American consciousness is the idea that you can have a black male in your home. And they found this so offensive, they refused to check what they were like, whichever child was in need. And so, lo and behold, they got an African-American child, a boy. And this boy, they, they got him, and they decided, well, they have an African-American boy, and they're going to raise him as who they are. They are Jews. He'll be raised as a Jew. And they named him Jonah, started the process, and that's when they began to encounter the world of American race relations in relation to Judaism. Because on the one hand, we have these, we, we have this, this statement in the American experience in which we say Judaism is a religion. And as a religion then, there is, there is no, there should not be any race issue at all. All, in other words, if you have a religion, then people from a variety of racial backgrounds practice that religion. So why then is it one of those things like, you know, the party's going and suddenly, you know, the DJ's going, so you hear the, 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 the vinyl scratch. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And the party stops when he shows up yeah. with his black shot. Right? Why is this going on? And this now brings out the Tobins. Because you see, to give you a little background on who Gary Tobin was, he was a young man from St. Louis, Missouri. He is from a, was from a secular Jewish background. As a child, he was very creative. In fact, one of the things I came across after he died was his high school, one of his high school projects, where he outlined and had all kinds of things about dealing with communities, and he, he, he had all kinds of, of drawings and ideas. Very, very vibrant person. He studied, he did his PhD in urban planning at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And when he went to teach in St. Louis, he got involved in Jewish issues because he was concerned about how, in the way Jews were counted, a lot of Jews, well, didn't count. And you could see how his training in urban planning connects to this because, you know, as an urban planner, his view was very pragmatic. If there's something wrong, what do you do to fix it? How do you get things done? And so he got involved in debates with individuals in Jewish demography, and in those debates he began to, it, it, this led to his moving to Brandeis, running a center, and it led to him realizing if he's going to be in these debates, he needs to understand more about Judaism than simply being a born Jew. And so this led, although he was already a Jew, this led to him going through the process of becoming a member of a conservative Jewish synagogue and he would publicly present himself as a convert, although he was already a born Jew. And this is a theme with many Jews, especially many African American Jews, that a lot of us don't realize. That many, I've discovered a lot of the community I meet who are converts are people already born Jews, but what found the conversion process as a way of learning about Judaism. And so, as he was involved in these issues, he got involved in a lot of other Jewish issues, particularly issues around the, the question of the state of Israel, and around questions in terms of conflicts around civil rights. And as, uh, as uh, Capers remarked in our podcast, well, he was the most, how can you put it, the most liberal Republican he ever met. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, uh, and by this, you know, we forget, you know, I've heard this quite a bit. It's funny how many people, also on the left, lament the demise of liberal Republicans. But what this was about was a situation in which, when he saw the situation in the academy at Brandeis, you know, you work really hard, you get a lot of funding, you build centers, but as you know, um, universities can also be very brutal places. And there are places in which um, it is possible to, 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 in spite of his liberal republicanism, experience what Marx would call, well, alienation. <laughs> and I mean the Marxist sense of alienation, right? 
And so he realized that to not be alienated from his labor, he and his wife, Diane Tobin, created the Institute for Jewish Research and Community because they wanted to be able to set the conditions of offering an alternative understanding of Jewish life. And it was in that context that Behol Hashem, in every tongue, was created. Now this, this rubric led to a situation in which he began to argue, for instance, in opening the gates, he began to argue around how Jewish communities need to be more welcoming. And you know, one of the odd things, especially if you do work on, 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 on race and social thought, and if you do work on Jews in particular, one thing I always mention when I speak at synagogues is it's incredible how much, um, especially Jews, don't know about Jewish history. Mm -hmm. You know? So there's this belief, for instance, that this thing about keeping, you know, not bringing people into Judaism, being insular, is Jewish. But it actually isn't Jewish. It was something imposed upon Jews in 312 under the period of Constantine. When a Roman emperor facing Jewish proselytizers and Christian proselytizers <laughs> became Christian. And there were laws implemented that if Jews were to convert people to Judaism, they were punishable, it was punishable by death. Now you can imagine, by the way, I, I usually bring this up to, to, to folks, you can imagine if you are in a community where marriage, for instance, is premised upon someone being brought into the community, well, bringing someone into the community could be published, pun punishable by death. That's a pretty surefire way to make Jews insular, isn't it? And you know, what's funny about it is, you know, again, that period of proselytizing in the past was a period, for instance, in the Roman Empire, per, before Constantine, where Jewish populations grew significantly. You know, the difference between the people in Judea and people around the other areas of the Roman Empire was a period in which, under a period of 150 years, Within the Roman Empire, populations of people today, whom we will call Jews, went from 150,000 to 8 million. That means that there was a large population of what we would today call converts. But here's the crucial thing. When that edict was placed in 312, it meant that that population within the Roman terrain was pretty much frozen in, in genetics terms in history. And that's why that group, when many people think of Jews today, they're really thinking of what a Roman looked like in 312 A.C.E. <laughs> what they don't realize, though, is that the Roman Empire was vast. It included North Africa. It included parts of East Africa. And even outside of the Roman Empire, there were also the diaspora of Judeans throughout the Persian areas, India, all these other areas. And this led to very interesting developments. When, if one is going to talk about Judaism and race, one is automatically, from this narrative I just gave you, talking about a multiracial population. Okay? And one of the things one has to realize then is the kind of work that every tongue was doing, or what we do at the Center for Afro Jewish Studies. When we say Afro Jews, for instance, we do not mean Afro as monolithical or Jews as monolithical. As we know, we're talking about two highly diverse communities meeting to create even more diversity. But one of the things we begin to realize is talking about race and talking about Jews together becomes more complicated than many of us may think. And, I, and right now I'm giving a short introduction, so I'll just make two remarks and then we begin to connect it through. You could see, for instance, that I'm raising this problem of history because it connects to the question of memory. And that's one of the reasons why we'll have Professor Levitt speak. But right now, I'll give you two discourses that will give you what I mean. As we know, in recent, <coughs> in terms of politics, particularly in the United States over the past 40, 40 to 50 years, there's a lot of antipathy to talking about race, while we're in a heavily racialized situation. And particularly with <coughs> Jewish Americans, 
There's a lot of antipathy to talking about race. But what's odd about the Peninsula all the way up into southern France? It was looked at as the colonization of Christendom. And within that period, the kind of terms that developed were terms such as the term Raza or Raza. And Raza referred to breeds of dogs, horses, and Jews, and Moors. So you could see Raza is the word from which we get the word race. So the thing that's tricky here is Jews and Afro-Muslims were at, were at the moment of the formation mm -hmm. of the concept of race. The thing that's weird, though, is the word raza was from the Arabic word ra, which is related to the Hebrew word rosh, which means head, or the um, um, Amharic ras. And you put all that together, it also refers to origin or beginnings. So you can see the term was connected to the experience in Christendom of people who are supposed to be outside coming in. Well, this term, when Columbus landed, had to be expanded because the world also now had Native Americans. It also had lots of people who were neither Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. And this began to take form in terms of explanations that led to some of the modern issues we have today. But the complicated thing is even with those issues around race, what's it, what this tells you is race is something that comes onto you, not something that comes out of you. And once we realize that, it can explain why people could be surprised that as they travel through the world, they're one race in one place, and they're a different race in another. Well, the Tobins were very aware of this. And they tried to, it's interesting that their work did not only involve reaching out, but bringing in by actually having people move through the world. Because those communities of Jews who were meeting when I met them were experiencing the same thing I experienced. It's one thing to hear about the Lemba in theory. It's another thing to hear about the Ibu Jews in theory. It's another thing to hear about Mizrahim, to hear about Abba Yudaya in theory. It's another thing to have flesh and blood looking you in the face and telling you his or her experience. But the complicated thing about this issue now is how do people really meet across races? And this is one of the issues that the Tobins were, were bringing up. They were bringing up how the interrogating of Jewish life and its relation to race needed to be done. Because as we know, it's not simply the question that Judaism is a religion. Most rabbis would explain, if that were really so, then secular Jews are just not Jews. But no rabbi takes seriously the idea that a secular Jew isn't a Jew. Because the rabbis work within an understanding, a cultural understanding, of who, what the people are, and the ways in which those things can connect. And this complicated relationship is what they were trying to articulate, to point out the idea of what it is to look at Jewish life as a living reality. Now, the living reality plays out in strange ways. And what do I mean? Well, I was just reflecting um, um, with, with Capers about my, my visits to Israel. And it's a funny thing when you go to Israel. And what I mean by this is, one time when I was in Israel, before that I spoke at a conference in Jamaica of Caribbean and Latin American Jews. And when I spoke at this meeting of Caribbean and Latin American Jews, well, the audience looked just like this room, OK? And, as, and I took a lot of pictures, and you know, and because it just looked like my family. My family are pretty much, you know, my, my, my mother's family were, were, were from Irish Jews, and my mother's father's family, my mother's mother's family, my mother's father's family were from Jews from Jerusalem. And we look at the picture, the thing that's funny is in my childhood, never, ever, ever, ever was my mother's mother's family called white. Never ever. We, my entire consciousness of them was just that they were light-skinned black people. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? So what's funny was um, I took pictures, and whatever I, what's interesting is 
when I go to Israel and I show the pictures, some of the friends were saying, which ones are the blacks? And what this tells you is something interesting about race. If you define a group of people in a way that you want to expand the concept of whiteness, you're going, I'm sorry, if you're going to center the concept of whiteness, it tends to exclude a lot of people. What's interesting, if you define it in terms of the concept of blackness, it tends to include a lot of people. It's very interesting how these race concepts work. Now, how do I know, how do I know this? Well, if I show the same pictures to many black people, they'll see a lot of black people in the room. They'll see a small number of white people. But if you're white-centered, you're right, you're going you're to try to see more white people in the room. And so what this tells you is something interesting. I meet many people in Israel who, most of Israel, are immigrants, who the country they're coming from, they were not white people. But in Israel, they're white people. And then when they leave Israel to another country, they become colored people again. All right? And I know this because I know people, for instance, in the academy who did Aliyah to Israel, who then came here, and they're on faculty as people of color in many universities. So they know what they are. Now, when I say they know what they are, I don't mean what they are as fixed. What I mean is we understand Jewish people as a people who are always negotiating race. You see what I'm, I'm getting at? So in some contexts, you're a light-skinned black person, or you're a Latina, or you're a, a Southwest Asian. In another context, you may find any. I am shocked um, at how many things I have been in terms of what people think I am over the years. Right now, I was joking with my beard this way. You know, I could really hang out in, this is a Philly joke. I could hang out in Germantown with no problem. You know, I just, I just need a knitted. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when I'm shaved, you know, when I first came to Temple, I was shaved. There were students who kept saying to me, so how long have you been in this country? I'm thinking. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, okay, you know. So, you know, they, they said, so do you miss India? <laughs> and, you know, and I was like, India? <laughs> I remember I went to my grandmother and said, you know, these days I supposedly miss India. And you might grab it here. You gotta, it's, it's so sad when we lose the elderly in our lives. And if you have elderly parents, so I talk to them. My grandmother quickly said, well, you know. <laughs> it turns out that um, her, her mother's paternal side, her, her mother's paternal uh, grandmother was a slave from Pondicherry, India. That's why it was so funny when, Gary, when I was at one of the Kola show meetings, they kept saying, Stand up if you're descended from people from this place. Stand up. I have to stand up every time. <laughs> and, you know, this, but this brings out this interesting point. I remember once I was on a bus and a Pashtun came up to me and was trying to talk to me. He said I was from her village and I said, I'm not. I'm not. And then finally she got angry and said, oh, people come to the United States. <laughs> in the bus, you know? yeah. but, but this brings out this, this point, right? You know, the way we define each other affects how we see each other. You know, if everybody in this room suddenly had a birth certificate that said you were black, let's say, it's interesting how people will see you. You know, they'll look at you, and I guarantee you, they'll see the blackness in you. They'll see it, they'll see from the way you walk, talk, eat, dance, everything, you will become black. And if they define you in such a way, you have this little certificate that says there, you're white, they'll suddenly be saying, well, you're not white, but they'll start seeing the whiteness in you. And you could define any other category. So this fluid certificate that says there, you're white, they'll suddenly be saying, well, you're not white, but they'll start seeing the whiteness in you. And you could define any other category. So this fluidity, raises an interesting question about how one does things like community outreach, how one does things like trying to understand how communities relate to each other globally, and also from a scholarly point of view, raises questions about how when we go back and look at records, how we are able to understand who is there. 
And I can tell you something, and I'm going to end here. As we have gone back and looked through records, what's interesting is how Jews or Judeans have configured in those records. Because almost everywhere where there are prohibitions, right, this is it's not outside of the category of Roman territory, but everywhere else there have been prohibitions against, once you get the white, black stuff going, against miscegenation. For some reason, and for the obvious reasons, it didn't apply to people who were defined as Jews. Even in places, you know, even in the, the sacred category. You know how America is about the idea of white women and black men. But European Jewish women, you can find records of, even in the period of miscegenation in the South, who married black men. And this tells you then that we have to ask a question about how we understand who or what communities are when we study them. Okay? So it's in that spirit we're going to have conversations today, and I will stop here. Thank you.